Our Bible reading for this message is taken from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 4. And Joseph also went up from the Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Amen. We'll end our reading at verse 14. May the Lord bless his word to your heart. We'll bow together in prayer, seeking the Lord just briefly. And then I would like you afterward to listen to a message and song for this Christmas time of the year. Please consider the words and I trust it will be a blessing to your heart and to your soul. We'll bow firstly in prayer. Eternal and our everlasting God in heaven. We thank thee that we are able to come into thy presence at this time. We thank thee, O God, for bringing us once more to this Christmas time of the year when we think particularly of the birth and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth. We rejoice in thy goodness unto us and in thy grace. And Father, we ask that thou wilt remember then again as we meet around the word of God, each individual, we pray that our souls will be prepared to receive the engrafted word of God that is able to save the soul. We pray that we might experience the Lord's help and his ministry. And, O oh God, our Father, we pray that thou wilt, in thy grace and in thy mercy, then visit our hearts at this time. Lord, we pray for each one who will Watch this recording and listen in. We ask that thou wilt remember them. And uh, may there be a word in season for their heart. We think about our congregation in Dungannon and our people. Lord, bless them and encourage them and help them. We pray for the sick. We pray for the troubled, for the bereaved. We ask that thou wilt bless every home and every family. And Lord, may we enjoy much of the Lord's peace and see much of Christ at this time. And so remember our land also, our nation and the nations of this world. We're ever conscious of the pressures of the COVID virus. We're ever conscious, O oh God, of the stress and strains that it has brought to so many. We pray for our health services. We ask thee, O God, that thou wilt remember our doctors and our professionals and those who assist in any way in the treatment of people who have contacted this disease. We pray, O God, that thou wilt bless those in authority, give them wisdom and direction at this time. Let them know the blessing of God and thy continued grace. And we pray that thou wilt lead us through this difficulty and this trouble. Remember, O oh God, the vaccines that have been produced, we pray that they will be effective. And Lord, we ask that in thy mercy, thou wilt bring us out of this current difficulty and show thyself, Lord, as a God who answers prayer and hears the cries of his people. Be with us now as we linger around the word of God for a little time. 
in Christ's holy name. Amen. found in Isaiah chapter 9 and the verse 6. And there we read in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Our Bible reading a little earlier from Luke chapter 2 records the events surrounding the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The coming of Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem to participate in the Roman census and his birth there speaks of the humanity of Christ because verse 7 in Luke chapter 2 says that there was brought forth her firstborn son of Mary at that time. So Christ is a true human being. The laying of the newborn Christ in the manger, because the inn was fully occupied, speaks of his humiliation, because he came to this earth in a mean and lowly manner. Then we have the announcement of his birth to the shepherds by the angel who had been dispatched from heaven for that purpose. That's his honour, because never in the history of the world has the 
birth of any child been announced in such a manner as this by a heavenly messenger. Of course, it's true to say that the coming of the Lord Jesus didn't take Bible scholars really by surprise because so much of the Old Testament is taken up by the prophecies concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nor was the Lord Jesus the only one whose birth was prophesied in the word of God. For example, if I could turn you to Genesis chapter 17 and the verse 19, you will see that the Lord said to Abraham, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. So that Isaac and the coming of Isaac was prophesied in scripture. That's how it was in relation to Samson as well. Judges chapter 13 verses 4 and 5. The messenger from heaven said unto the wife of Manoah. Now therefore beware I pray thee and drink not wine or strong drink and eat not any unclean thing. For lo thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And again in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 12 and 13. Whenever David considered building the temple for the Lord. Nathan the prophet brought him news from the Lord. And said to him that the Lord said I will set up thy seed after thee. Which shall proceed out of thy bowels. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And so the Lord prophesied and instructed David that a son not yet born to him would build the temple. That son was Solomon. And therefore what I'm saying to you is that there were a number in Old Testament times whose birth was prophesied. Malachi chapter 4 and the verse 5 gives a general prophecy to Israel in regard to the coming of John the Baptist. Behold I will send you Elijah the prophet. Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And that prophecy was repeated in the New Testament. To John's father Zacharias in Luke chapter 1 and the verse 13. Therefore the birth of others was foretold in scripture. But Christ's coming was distinct and different in that his coming was repeatedly highlighted throughout Old Testament times. And when we delve into the New Testament, we discover that uh, prophecies concerning Christ were noted as being fulfilled on a regular basis. For example, in Matthew chapter 1 and the verse 22, we read, that what was done in relation to the birth and the coming of Christ was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. Matthew chapter 2, verse 15, also highlights the fact of the prophecy concerning the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, where it says that, Mary and Joseph took the young child after his birth down into Egypt and he was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying out of Egypt have I called my son. Further also in the final verse or two of our Bible reading in Luke chapter 2 verse 11 for example reference is made to our text from Isaiah chapter 9 and the verse 6. And again that reference, reference in Luke chapter 2 verse 11. Acts as a fulfilment of what's written in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. And if you compare those two verses. The one in the New Testament in Luke chapter 2. And the one in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. You will see that the angel said in Luke chapter 2 11. For unto you is born this day. Our text in Isaiah 9 
Verse 6 begins by saying, for unto us a child is born. The angel could not say us because Christ was not born for angels but for men. He was born for us. And so whenever the angel spoke to the shepherds, he reminded them of the fact that what was happening in the birth of the Saviour was in effect the fulfilment of a prophecy that had been given many hundreds of years before in Isaiah chapter 9 and the verse 6. And in his being born, Christ is given the most wonderful names in order to describe his character and his glorious person. In his work entitled Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare penned the words, what's in a name? A rose by other, any other name would smell as sweet. And what Shakespeare was saying and indicated that in his opinion, it wouldn't matter what word was used to describe a rose, it would still give off the same beautiful smell. And so he asked the question, what is in a name? And ordinarily, it may be the case that there's very little in a name. But that's not how it is when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is everything in his name. The hymn writer said, Jesus, oh, how sweet the name. Indeed, such are the wonders and the glories and the beauties of Christ that one name is not sufficient to describe him. Our text has five names that I wish to highlight to you. Isaiah 9 verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. What's in a name as far as Christ is concerned? There are many things in his name and in the names that are attributed to him. Firstly, from our text, you will see the Lord Jesus here described as wonderful. Now, some people read the two words wonderful counselor together, but that's not what the Bible says. If you read carefully the, the word of God, the Lord Jesus is described as wonderful. Then there's a comma, then Counselor, to distinguish the fact that these two are separate names. If you look then at Judges chapter 13 and the verse 18, where the Lord appeared unto Manoah regarding the birth of Samson, you will see that the Lord says, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? And if you have a margin in your Bible, you will discover that the word that's translated secret really is wonderful. It's the same word that's used in Judges 8, 13 verse 18 as appears in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. And therefore we can deduce from what is written in Judges chapter 13 that it was Christ who appeared to Manoah and to his wife as the one who is wonderful. And isn't Christ wonderful to the soul of the child of God? He is the one who is wonderful. In the midst of this mad, changing, uncertain world, it's essential that you have a constant, a hope, an assurance. In Acts chapter 20, in the verse 22, Paul spoke of going to Jerusalem. And he spoke of going to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. But in verse 24, he was able to say, but none of these things move me or alarm me. Why? Because Christ was wonderful to his soul. Some of you might be interested in football. If you are, you may have heard the word Pele, reportedly the greatest footballer that the world has ever seen. 
The word Pele, as used by the footballer, originally comes from Hawaii. In fact, it's a girl's name. It means goddess of lightning and fire. The word Pele also appears in the Hebrew, in which the Old Testament was written. And the word Pele is wonderful. Here in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, that's what the word is in the original language. His name shall be called Pele. The word means wonderful. And you see, child of God, you and I are here reminded that Christ is the Pele of the soul, the darling of the soul, the most wonderful delight and joy of the soul. In the second place from our text, the Lord Jesus is called counselor. The word literally speaks of someone who is of a high rank. Someone who is able to stand in the presence of princes and kings and act as their advisor. It's the same today. Kings, rulers, presidents, prime ministers, they all have their advisors, those who direct them. Who in some instances tell them what to say, what line to take upon a certain matter. And that's the thought behind the word counsellor here in our text. He is a revealer of the direction that a king or a ruler should take. You see, if you and I don't have someone to direct us and advise us through life, we'll, we'll make a mess of our lives. That's true regarding salvation. Without an advisor, you who are without Christ, you will lose your soul at the last. Your sin will certainly ensure that. Because sin gives man a wrong view of God of the holiness of God, of man's own standing in the sight of God. And sin blinds a man to his need of Christ. Where do you get direction in regard to salvation? Well, it comes through Christ. Because Christ is the revealer of the Father's will. That's what makes Christ a counsellor, the greatest counsellor, the only counsellor. In that there is none other to direct you in the matter of your salvation. And of course Christ not only tells of salvation, but he is salvation. Whenever Christ came to this earth, he came as the word of God incarnate. He came to demonstrate and to show to you and me and to mankind the Father's heart. And reveal the Father's will for man's redemption and man's salvation. And therefore Christ, in his coming to earth, he comes not only to tell you of Christ, but he comes in order to complete salvation for you. He tells of himself, he points to himself as the only saviour. In this he is the Lord's counsellor. Coming from God to reveal to mankind the heart, the mind, the love, the redemption that the Lord has planned from all eternity. And therefore, can I say to you, if I'm speaking to someone without the Lord Jesus today, he's the one you must get to if you would have your sins dealt with. In Egypt, during the years of famine, when the people came to Pharaoh for bread, Genesis chapter 41 verse 55 tells us that Pharaoh said unto the people, Go to Joseph, what he saith unto you, do. And that's what I would say to you who are not saying at this particular Christmas time of the year. Go to Christ, flee to him with all haste. There's not a moment to waste because time is short. Take him as your saviour. He's the counsellor. In regard to salvation. Again Christ is a counsellor. In that he reveals the father's will. In all our situations. Are you a child of God? Do you need direction as to how to live your life? Well he directs your paths. You'll make mistakes if you don't listen. To what the Lord has to say in his word. Or if you go to the wrong counsellor. Scripture's full. Of those who paid a heavy price for heeding wrong advice. You think about King Rehoboam. 
who listen to the advice of the young men and instead of going to the wise old heads in his government and listening to them. As a result, he split his kingdom. Think about King Saul who went to the witch of Endor and it cost him not his kingdom, it cost him his life. Because you read in 1 Chronicles 10 verses 13 and 14 that Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord which he kept not. And also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it and inquired not of the Lord. Oh, a wise man inquires of the Lord in the things of this life. He seeks counsel from him. And the Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He's able to direct you in life. Go by what the Lord says. Whatever it is that troubles you or causes you disquiet, go by what the Lord says. Seek out the word of God in every matter. Seek out God's will and follow it implicitly. Christ is the counselor. He's also thirdly the mighty God. Never forget that. He's the mighty God in order that your faith may rejoice in his ability to accomplish for you a complete redemption. That's why he's described as the mighty God. Everything you need for the purchase and the rescue and the well-being and the keeping of your soul, you find in him whenever temptation to sin comes. Remember, he's the mighty God who can deliver you. Flee to him. He'll give you grace, all the grace you need. Remember, Christ is God, the divine, the word made flesh. He is the mighty God, the word made flesh. You'll recall what John chapter 1 and the verse 1 says concerning Christ. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Who can create the world but God? Well, Christ created the world. Who can know the mind? Of a man as Christ knew the mind of Nathaniel, but God. Who but God could calm the sea and hush the wind and walk upon that sea? Who but God could know the full purpose of the traitor Judas Iscariot? Whose death? But the death of Christ, the Son of God, would cause the graves of the old saints around Jerusalem to open. And the curtain of the temple to rend from top to bottom and darkness to cover the face of the earth. Who but God could rise from the dead the third day, thereby overthrowing all the laws of nature and man and what was acceptable human practice. The babe in the manger is the mighty God. And even though his might, his deity, was clothed in human flesh, in the human flesh of a little child, not for one second, did he cease to be God? Fourthly, Christ is the everlasting Father. The man abiding forever as it might be rendered. Now, in relation to the Godhead, of course, Christ is distinct from the Father. That Trinitarian Godhead, you will know, is made up of Father, Son and Holy Ghost. They are three separate persons, all part of the, the one Godhead. And Christ in that Godhead is always the Son of God. But you ought to remember that the Jews employed the word Father in a much wider sense than you and I use it. So the word Father to a Jew could mean either a literal father or a grandfather or some other sort of an ancestor or a ruler or an instructor. Indeed, the word Father could be employed among the Jews for one who possesses something. He's the father of it. He owns it. Or again, one is said to be a father among the Jews in the sense that he is a nourisher. That is, he bestows his benefits upon something in the way that a parent bestows blessings upon a child. You see, a true father provides for his child. Care, food, clothing, instruction to his child. And Christ is born a father in the sense that he will provide all things necessary to the eternal redemption and well-being of his people. What a saviour. He's all you need in life. He's all you require in death. 
He's the everlasting Father. And he provides for you day after day after day. And then again in the final place, he's the Prince of Peace. The Christ of the manger is a king. And as a king, he brings perpetual peace between the sin-sick soul and the holy God. Whenever the angel said, peace on earth, goodwill to all men, to the shepherds, he was speaking in the spiritual. Because there's not peace on earth today. There are conflicts between nations, ongoing from year to year. And among nations, no one really knows how many people die in those conflicts every year. Thousands, tens of thousands, maybe far more. And then come down to the more personal level. There are fights, arguments, disputes, fallouts by the hundred, maybe by the thousand every day among individuals at work, perhaps. In the family setting, there's disputes whenever people drive their car with one another on the road or when they travel in the air. Even Christians disagree and argue with one another. There's no peace on earth. Because the peace, and this is the point of this description of the Lord, he's the Prince of Peace. The, the peace that Christ brings is an eternal peace. It's a peace that is in heaven alone. Because it is in heaven alone that wars and battles and conflicts will truly cease. That's why Christ came. To take you and I to a place where there will be no more conflict. And no more sorrow. And so my dear friend. If you're in the midst of some great conflict. At this moment in time. Look to him for grace. And for help. And go forward in the assurance. That it will only last for a little time. And that whenever the time comes for you and I. To leave. Down the things of this life. And this world that we shall go to be with him. And we shall go to the place where there is no more conflict. And no more dispute. And no more tears. And no more disappointment. Oh may the Prince of Peace. And the peace that he gives rule in your heart at this time. And if you don't know the peace that comes through being reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, I trust that you might find that peace even at this Christmas time of the year. Thank you for watching. May the Lord bless you. May you have a happy and a blessed Christmas. For the Lord Jesus sake. Amen. We'll close in a word of prayer please. Our Father and our God, we commit this word to thee. We pray that thou wilt write it upon all of our hearts, that thou wilt speak through thy truth, and bless those who have listened, and may our understanding of the scriptures increase, our understanding of Christ grow, and may we constantly walk with God. Separate us now in thy fear, with thy blessing, in the Saviour's name, Amen.